Oh, um, Taylor, you can just steal the share if you'd like. Um, okay. Taylor is in um, Sally Temple's group at the North Stemstone Institute in New York State and has really a, a, a study she's going to present to us today that is directly related to our main interest, right? The how do you grow many lines knowing that each one of them can react differently to conditions. Um, so the, the same protocol does not elicit the same response from all cell lines. Um, thanks for inviting me. I'm really excited to share our work on um, cortical organoids for tauopathies. So at the Neural Stem Cell Institute, we're interested in studying neurogeneration, specifically tauopathies. Tauopathies are a class of diseases that are classified by this buildup of abnormal tau in the brain. Um, MAPT is the gene that encodes for tau. There has been over 50 different mutations that have been identified um, sufficient to cause disease. So we use these MAPT mutations um, to study tauopathies in a disc. And we have this really nice line collection um, that was spearheaded by Celeste Karch at Wash U, uh, where we have over 100 different iPSC lines. Um, these lines are collected from patients with MAPT mutations, different MAPT mutations. Um, we've used CRISPR to correct these mutations back to MAPT wild types. So we have isogenic pairs, um, as well as healthy donors. We've knocked in these mutations. So this is a really nice line collection we can use to start studying these diseases in a dish. Um, and so for some of our first studies using uh, brain organoids to study these diseases, we use the Sergio Pashka protocol um, published in 2019. And we are able to uh, validate that these, these brain organoids go through similar stages of development that we see in human development. And that's to say at early ages, around day 20, we see these um, lots of progenitor cells in these organoids. And over time, we see uh, maturation of the deep and upper layer neuron subtypes, as well as glia, that at later times are astrocytes. And one of these first studies we used, we focused on one MAPT mutation, V337M, and we had three isogenic pairs of V337M and their isogenic corrected controls. We used single cell sequencing to uh, characterize these organoids at three different time points. Uh, we have identified 16 different neuron subtypes in these organoids, and they mature over time. Um, and really encouragingly, we are able to identify tau phenotypes in these organoid systems. So at the early time points, there are no differences in the mutant versus wild type organoids. And over time, we see the mutant organoids um, have this hyperphosphorylation of tau, which is really nice phenocopy of the disease um, progression. So I won't spend time talking about this, uh, it's not the focus of this talk today, but just to say that we are really encouraged to use iPS derived brain organoids to study aging and neurodegenerative diseases. And we're able to see phenotypes and look early prior to neuronal cell death, we can look at these early changes that are happening in the organoids. So this is really the motivation to use these systems um, to study these diseases. But we were faced with the challenge of using these organoid systems to study diseases across a lot of different lines, um, not only in efficiency of the protocol, but also reproducibility, um, specifically cell line to cell line, which is, I think, the motivation of this the seminar series. So I will walk you through what we found and some of the ways we are trying to address these, these challenges we face. So in the original protocol, uh, Organoids are generated in dishes. Um, and what happens is you start with 300 spheroids of iPSCs, and these spheroids can quickly fuse. And you go from 300 organoids to maybe 40 organoids in a dish in 20 days. Um, so this requires a lot of um, labor to, to, to go in and, and separate these organoids so you, you can generate enough. And what we've done is we've translated this this method into a 96 well plate format. We're using specialized 96 well plates um, called slit wells, and there are slits in between each well. So the media is still shared across the whole plate, but the organoids are in separate wells. 
Um, so now eliminates the need to cut these organoids apart, and we've gone from less than 10% efficiency to 100% efficiency in our organoid system. Um, the, the small molecules and the sequential changes are, are, are kept the same as the original protocol. We can originally uh, immediately see some of the benefits of culturing the organoids in these systems. Um, in the original protocol, when you grow with dishes, you'll get lots of different sized organoids, and this can be different cell line to cell line and, and dish to dish. And in this system, we have now really nice reproducibility in the growth curves. And this is not just within a, within a line or within a plate, but batch to batch and across lines. We have this really predictive growth curve. Um, and we can use this growth curve actually to QC our organoids, organoids that are not patterning um, as predicted will will not follow, will not always follow this, this growth pattern. So this was really encouraging. So we went ahead and start doing these large batches across a lot of different lines. Um, and this is an example of one of our first batches in the system. And what we found is half of the lines pattern beautifully towards cortex. And this is um, shown here looking at TBR1 at two months, one of our QC um, checkpoints. But the other half of the lines did not pattern well in, in this protocol. And here's just some a couple of examples of what I mean by poorly patterning organoids. We, we sometimes get lots of neurons, but only a pocket of them will show uh, cortical specific markers such as TBR1 and CTIP2 at the two month time point. We just get a little pocket. And in extreme cases, we'll generate organoids that lack neurons altogether. They'll have a few, but the majority of the neuron organoid is lacking neurons. So what have we done to address these different changes? Um, I'll go through two different ways we, we've identified that helps. Um, and this is an example of our, one of our more recent batches across 17 different lines, six different donors, and only two out of these 17 lines are patterning well. And um, I just pulled out a couple images here to show you that, you know, we see really robust CTIP2 and TBR1 expression at two months. Those are the cortical subtypes we'd expect to see at two months. And it's it's really more uniform across the organoid and across in between organoids and in between lines. Great All right. All right, unless that's a question. All right, so here's an example of one of these first batches. We did 12 different lines, six different isogenic pairs. And I hope you can immediately appreciate in this UMAP, two of one isogenic pair, two of these lines, looks extremely different than the rest of the batch. And when you look at what the cells are in these organoids, um, we find a lot of mesoendodermal cell types, um, cell types we do not expect to see in brain organoids. And this is single cell sequencing at two months. And from here, we are able to identify a new QC marker we can use to identify these, these mispatterned organoids, um, which is colon A2. They nicely um, label these, these lines that are not performing well in the protocol. And you can look for this marker early, as early as day six, day 20. You can see that in mispatterned organoids that do not have TBR1 have this high level of colon A2, um, and well-patterned organoids do not. So this really had us wondering, you know, why are these lines misbehaving in this protocol so dramatically than all the others? <clears throat> and what we found was this relationship between the pluripotency of the iPSC and the quality of these organoids. And that is to say that the lines that are generating these mesoendodermal cells um, that are unwanted in our organoids have lower levels of pluripotency. Um, shown here with SSEA4 and TRA160 double positive um, that we do by flow cytometry. And when we looked at how we we're growing our iPSCs, these iPSCs were all grown in mTeaser um, with the media replaced daily. Uh, FGF2 is a critical signaling um, for maintaining pluripotency. And in mTeaser, we're using the soluble FGF2 and the half-life of FGF2 is about four hours. So your cells are really experiencing these dramatic fluctuations in their FGF2 levels when you're using soluble FGF2. 
And when we switch to growing all of our IPS lines using FGF2 disc, um, this was developed here at the Neural Stem Cell Institute is, and is commercially available through our startup company, Stem Cultures. We're able to sustain the level of FGF2 for the whole week. So we don't have to feed as often, and this is a native form of FGF2. And when we make organoids from batches that were grown with the FGF2 disc, we're able to almost completely eliminate these off targeted cells and we only have just a little bit again across the same 12 lines that were in the first batch. We did some work to say what is different in IPSCs grown with a disc versus IPSCs grown with daily M teaser with the, with the soluble FGF2. The top um, pathway that pops up when you do a bulk RNA sequencing is the regulation of pluripotency in stem cells. I mean, this is across 11 lines, so not just the lines that we're seeing this dramatic improvement in the organoids, but across other lines, we're still seeing this improvement in pluripotency. Uh, we also ran a tax seek on these iPSCs, and we see enrichment in the TED motifs, and TEDs are a really important uh, transcriptional regulator that maintains pluripotency in this pluripotent state and and prevents the switch to a mesoendodermal differentiation. Um, so the, the disc seems to be helping this as well, which fits with, with what we see in the organoids, which is a, a reduction of these mesoendodermal cells. So that's the first way that we've, we've tried to, to create a more homogeneity in, across our cell lines. The second, um, issue we've run into is there are lines that are pluripotent. They don't create mesoendodermal cells, but we still have um, a lack of specification towards the cortex and the organoids. Here's an example of, of two of these lines, um, one isogenic set. You can appreciate here, we made organoids that made lots of neurons. And when we did our QC for the specif specific markers for cortex, we see that these organoids are, are lacking these cell types. So we see maybe little pockets here and there, but majority are, 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 are lacking these TBR1 and CTIP2, again, these early markers of, of, of um, cortical neurons. And what we found is if we can increase the concentration of the SB, which is a TGF beta inhibitor during those first six days of the protocol, we're now able to generate the same lines are now able to generate really beautifully well-patterned organoids. And you can appreciate that quite clearly in these, in these images. Here's uh, different sets of IPSC lines kind of showing the same thing, but here I'm trying to demonstrate the point that not all the lines need this increase in the TGF beta inhibitor, it's just a subset of lines. So here you're looking at two isogenic sets, four different lines. And isogenic set one patterns really quite nicely at the original protocol with 10 micromolar SB. And the, the second isogenic set does not. It prefers much more the 20 micromolar SB. And if you make all your organoids at 10 micromolar SB or all your organoids at 20, you can appreciate that, that the, the organoids you are making are different. And here, if you do a cell line dependent SB where you optimize the level for the line, now you make these organoids that are much more consistent in their um, composition at the single cell level. So, so why? why? Why do we have to tinker with this SB concentration to, to rein in these different cell lines? What we are finding is the lines that are performing better at the lower left level of the inhibitor have lower level of the receptor. And these lines that require higher level of the inhibitor, SB, have higher levels of ELK5, which is the receptor that SB is targeting. So we're here I'm demonstrating a few lines that we've worked with, and in black are lines we have not worked with. So we're, we're coming to the point where we're hoping we can predict what level of SB lines require based on their ELK5 expression at the IPSC stage.
so sort of at the, the end of this study, we, we did four different batches of organoids. We did them at different SB levels across 13 different lines, and we had 44 samples. Some patterned really beautifully and some did not. And we ran it through our QC and we are able to use with Fox Hunt uh, the single cell data. We are able to demonstrate that the lines that are failing our QC are, are not specified strongly towards cortex, more diffused specification across different brain regions. The organoids we've identified to pass QC, nice strong representation of, of, of cortical neuron transcriptomically. And what we're able to show is when you look at all the samples together, pattern organoids that patterned well, organoids that did not, what you can see is we are not picking up a lot of differentially expressed genes when we look at mutant versus wild type. When you just subset out the well pattern organoids and do your differential analysis between mutant and wild type, we're now able to see um, robust difference differences in their in the the neur the neuron subtypes we're interested in. Um, so this is one one way to 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 help rein in your your different cell lines is have really rigorous QC to understand how well your organoids have patterned and then look for these differences, wild type and mutants. So this is sort of a, a, a summary slide of, of the, the QC that we do and the protocol that we follow. Mm -hmm. It's really important to have start with really strong pluripotent cells. And this is not always apparent in just looking at the morphology of your culture. So we really recommend doing a fax analysis of TRA-160 and SSCA4 and strong pluripotent lines should be almost 100% double positive for both of these markers. Um, and then in, in our system, it's really important to QC the size of the spheroid before you start the org organoid production and then have checkpoints along the way for cortical specification. And with that, I will thank the Neural Stem Cell Institute and all of our collaborators for this hard work. Um, Kat Bowles at the University of Edinburgh did a lot of the single cell sequencing analysis for us. Um, Sally Temple, uh, the advisor and mentor of mine, um, that's really helped spearhead the, this discussion and, and this work on the, on, the, on, on the QC and the quality of our organoids. And with that, I'd say thank you and love to take any questions, easy or not easy. <laughs> Thanks, Taylor. Very cool. Any questions? I, I think it's rare that um, anyone shows such detailed all the way down to single cell data on showing the differences and tuning protocols and understanding line differences. It's very cool to see you guys spending all that effort on setup because uh, if you don't, then you don't know where, where your variation is coming from. Uh, ask a question and just interrupt yeah so um I, I need i need you just to clarify things for me a little bit so i understand exactly what you're saying so do i understand that if you if you control the tdf beta receptor with with the sb drug you have to tune the dose to the cell line yeah is that the idea that is the idea and um and then when you when you've done that you you differentiate with the protocol and you look like 30 days later or when you when you say they the neurons are the same or they're different when are you measuring that yep so um this is single cell data at 2 months so these are 2 months at 2 months okay. yeah It's 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 cool, right? I mean, but the question I I guess I'm trying to bring the two events together in my mind, right? The TGF beta function, mm -hmm. which is presumably very early, right? That's to do with pluripotency, and then the assay is way down two months later. Yeah, so you're so you're saying there's a real fake commitment, yeah, as a so consequence of this. Yeah, exactly. Cool. So okay. if we just look a little bit at the protocol right here, 
the, this SB, this TGF beta, that's part of the dual SMAD inhibition. And that happens the first six days of the protocol. And that's really helping the cells make those very first decisions on where they're going, neural ectoderm. And it seems that if you don't hit the right level of SB, you're not going to specify these, these neural progenitor cells towards a cortical um, phenotype. Right. And can you, can you use an earlier marker to show that? Can you use FESF2 or LHX2 or something like that to show right at the beginning that it's really the cortical fate that's being controlled? Yep. So at 20 days, we look for FOXG1 and PAC6, um, and we will, we will be able to pick up they look better or worse with different levels of SB at, at a 20 day stage. We haven't looked earlier, but we are always interested in earlier QC checkpoints. <laughs> yeah, well, you, we could continue. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for the question. It, it sounded like you guys are either thinking about or are checking the levels of the receptor and pluripotency. Um, I'm trying to think of, of what you showed us. Have you Have you checked if that is powerfully enough predictive to, to tune your your levels? Yeah, that is what we're working on, sort of a scorecard for the IPSC line. You know, look for your pluripotency, look for your ELK-5 level, and that should be predictive of what level you need in the protocol. We are still developing the best way to do that and, and how predictive it can be. Very cool. And I think I, I the think important thing is that these differences um, you do see them line to line, um, but they really reflect a lot of heterogeneity between IPS lines. And the idea that the, the lines are defined by relatively few pluripotency markers that we traditionally use, mm. I think can be misleading. Oh, yeah. Uh, and that there are differences within the line in expression of as, as Taylor's going to show some key markers and, that are important for these early decisions, just as Ron said, and that right now our approach is to tune the very early stage of the protocol to make sure we're making cortex. Um, but ideally, we'd actually be using these parameters to help make IPS lines <laughs> Um, with a more sort of constructed approach to how the IPS line should should look. Taylor, I think you were gonna. Yeah, but the only other addition I was gonna say is, you know, while we were working on the scorecard, we're still able to make well patterned organoids just by testing 10 and 20 micromolar. There might be an optimal dose for each line. But sort of on a practical level, we're able to just try two different concentrations and, and capture more similarities in our organoids across lines. It does seem to be driven by the donor of the IPSC line. However, we still do see differences, um, you know, a CRISPR edited or unedited line versus a parent line. I think that's also something we're finding. So it's really important if there's a CRISPR if you're doing isogenic pairs, if you have a CRISPR unedited line and edited line to compare, those are better isogenic sets than a parental line versus a CRISPR corrected. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to say uh, congratulations because it's a very important work and this is a real problem for all of us working with organoids. I also, I, I wanted to ask you if you, um, if you can comment on whether these improving pluripotency could also be beneficial for other, uh, you know, groups working with different type of organoids, you know, trying to do mesodermal differentiation, endodermal differentiation, because as far as I know, this is even harder for them. They see even more variability. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we are doing, uh, you know, the tri-diff lineage assays as well as longer um, mesodermal assays to show the the importance of how you grow that IPSC is really important. And I think kind of across the field, some people use Stemflex, some use MTZer Plus, some use MTZer, and there's just so much variation that when you build a protocol, that part is really important. You have to think about those earliest, earliest steps um, to have success and efficiency across all lines. Thank you. Yep. We have one uh, question from Alex uh, Jordan. Did you test the effects of other morphogens used in the protocol? 
Also, do you have counter issues when you increase SB on fates um, and other lines that don't require it? Yeah, those are really good questions. Um, we have tinkered with the other important small molecules in those first six days. So there's a, a BMP inhibitor, dorsomorphin, that we use, as well as other people use LDN. So we have um, played with those concentrations. And for the line that wasn't patterning well, that did not help. So it seems that maybe SB, but you can imagine there might be lines that do need tinkering in those other small molecules. Um, there is there is a sweet spot. If you have too much SB for a line that doesn't want SB, which um, mm. is shown nicely, it yeah, you can't just increase SB for, for all your lines. You have to um, tailor it. And it, it's a little less... Um, that's why the QC is just really so important. So this line, for example, it, it did okay at 20 micromolar. It's not um, terribly, terribly patterned, but it's not as well patterned as yeah. when you do it at 10. And do you know, is it cell autonomous, the levels of the receptor, or is it cell numbers or equivalent? Yeah. What do you think that is? Yeah, we are digging into it. Um, it does look to be um, pretty strongly associated with the donor. So for example, this is five different lines from this donor. So there is some variation. Some are CRISPR edited, some are not. Um, this is one line that was grown four different times. So it is relatively tight between batches. Um, so yeah, we're, we're digging into more. And then SB, you know, it, it hits ELK4 and ELK7. Um, it looks like it's more strongly related to the ELK5, but there's there's a lot more to dig in here, for sure. 